Hello, this is Jim Schaefer, executive producer and host of Rip Rap, the academic book television program. My guest today is Father Francisco Radecki. Today we'll be discussing the research on the Catholic Church that he completed with his twin brother, Father Dominic Radecki, which has culminated in the book, Tumultuous Times, 20 General Councils of the Catholic Church and Vatican II and its Aftermath. Welcome to Rip Rap. Thank you, Jim. Glad to be here. My first reaction as I was reading this book was my amazement at what a huge project this book is indeed. How and why did you and your brother decide to undertake it? Basically the book started very simply. I had a class I was giving on the 20 councils of the Catholic Church and I spent about five hours researching them and there were about 20 councils so I had about 100 hours of work and I thought I don't want to just lose all that work and so I just was going to make a simple book out of it and I, my twin and I, years earlier, actually wrote a book called What Has Happened in the Catholic Church, and after writing this, this took us two years, and we used about 500 reference books. We just made, I made a resolution never to write another book again. It was just too much work. So Tumultuous Time started small, but then I have a parishioner who is a research expert. Her name is Paula Storm, and she talked to me about interlibrary loan and about getting references to make it more detailed. And so after a while, I just said, yes, okay, I'll go ahead and do it. And I read about six books a week and was able to research for the uh, book Tumultuous Times. When we had the rough draft done, it was about 300 pages on the 20 councils. I showed it to the bishop, and that was after two years of work. And the bishop said, what about Vatican II? And we said, well, we already wrote a book on Vatican II. And he said, well, write another one. <laughs> so there's two more years of work, and uh, we ended up using about 1,100 reference books and periodicals from 25 countries to complete, and it took four years. So it was a big project and never thought it would take that long. But it um, was really quite interesting because being twins, uh, it really helped us put it together. We're in different parts of the country. My twin lives in Los Angeles area. I'm in Detroit, and um, he's more of a theologian. I'm more of a historian. And with the two of us, it kind of came together really well. And it, um, it just were both speed readers, so that helped, and we had our backgrounds in history and theology, and um, it really kind of, you know, just came together after a while. My twin said this is the toughest thing he's ever done in his life, <laughs> and he said, you have to be crazy to write something like this, but, you know, somehow God wanted it done, and it, you know, took time and perseverance, but it finally was done, and... Um, it's one thing I like about Tumultuous Times, it's different from a lot of history books. With, as I was doing research, my twin also, the more that you read, the more you found how many books were so difficult to grasp. They were written almost for rocket scientists, and you couldn't really grasp history or understand it. They just tried to show off their intelligence or just try to write above everyone. And so I thought, we're going to make this as like a novel, written like a novel. And that's what's nice about Tumultuous Times. We We loaded it with stories. A lot of historical information, maps, you know, it all came together. And like I said, it was just a lot of work, but we we're very happy how it turned out. So well, one thanks. of the things I want to really underscore is the historical reach of this project, because the first council was over 1,600 years ago. <laughs> yeah. And that's really fascinating in itself. What's interesting, Jim, on that point is we had to find cities that don't exist today. <laughs> we had to go to ancient maps. and. Um, so some of we actually had another set of twins that helped with our uh, book too. They uh, they helped do the graphics with the maps, and so we try to locate these cities and put them in modern countries, and uh, that was real interesting. And try to find documentation. We went back and we try to get every book in the English language, even in foreign languages, on the councils and in the history of those areas. And I really learned a lot. It, I was really surprised, and um, what I was I was amazed at is no book in the English language ev even says where these councils took place, the exact building. They tell you the city, but the building, some books lumped a lot of them together and just wanted it so it's simple and interesting. Well, and it fascinated me too that, the, that there were so many personal things were involved. I mean, the first, what was it, eight councils were, were in Turkey. But they were under the emperors? Emperor, the, you know, the East, mm -hmm, yeah, Constantinople. Very personal, how all that arranged and what happened at them. It really was. And, you know, and there's a lot of political things that occurred during those times. And 
Uh, it's amazing, a lot of them even finished. And uh, one account, so the papal legates were on the back home, they uh, captured by pirates and <laughs> kidnapped for about a year <laughs> and then finally returned. But I did think it opened up um, a, a lot of, of the historical reach also of the institution of the mm -hmm. Catholic Church, that it went back that far and then these councils were ways of trying to adapt to the different circumstances. It really is, and you learn a lot of histories like what we call Holy Viaticum, like when you give communion to someone who's dying, that goes back to the 300s. The idea even of indulgences was done in the early church, and uh, there was just a lot of interesting information that we learned too. Well, and they're, but they're very serious events. They were. I mean, they're who attended and how the business mm -hmm. was conducted and then how it was followed up on. Maybe was. talk a little bit about that. Yeah, with, um, the councils, actually, they're called ecumenical or general councils. Ecumenical is from ecumene, the Greek word, which means from the entire inhabited world. And like you mentioned earlier, Jim, there were eight in Turkey and then 12 in Europe was, would be in, in like Italy, um, the Vatican. France, uh, and then Constance, which is Germany, Switzerland. It's a city that's divided between those two countries. But the, uh, they were based on the Roman system at the time. And uh, they tried, what was interesting is bishops came together. There was a papal legate where the pope was present at the latter, the 12 last councils. And uh, they discussed Catholic teaching about, sometimes there were people called anti-popes that were uh, brought by some emperor and uh, they tried to deceive people, we'll talk about that in a little bit, uh, new beliefs that would surface, and the church had to define one way or another, is this right or is this not? And they'd look at what Christ taught and what the church constantly taught, and um, so there was a lot involved, and um, during the first council, it was interesting because a lot of the early bishops there were uh, tortured for their faith. You know, some of them were missing limbs, other ones were burned on their face, some were missing eyes. And uh, they were like champions of Christ. It's funny because uh, St. Nicholas Santa Claus came to the first council. And, Is uh, that right? Yeah. <laughs> but the, it was a very serious process. It I mean, was. They would take up issues and then, you know, talk about them and come to some kind of. I don't know if ruling is exactly, mm -hmm. but and that's where we actually, uh, Jim, it, where we get the what they call canon law. At the end of the council, there were different decrees, and those were called canons. And eventually, those were all compiled together. And uh, what a heretic is is a person who does not believe what's taught de fide or what we have to believe as a Catholic. And so there were different people. Like Arius was a priest in Libya that said Christ really wasn't God; he was just like God. And um, there were other people that denied the divinity of the Holy Ghost and then a visible church and you know different things like that, the authority of the church. So what's kind of amazing is where all the religions in the world, except the ones that predate Christianity, are, um, are formed during those times. It seems like every 500 years a new religion pops up. We think of, I think it's the uh, seventh century is when Islam began where Muhammad spread his beliefs in the East. We think of the Orthodox churches beginning around the 11th century, many of them, and some of them predate that, but those are the majority of them. And then in the 16th century, we see the Protestant Reformation, what Martin Luther did, and all the Protestant churches that we have today. You know, so uh, Vatican II is kind of interesting too, which is another 500 years from there. We see it just like almost a whole new religion. Well, I thought what's interesting is the way you were able to line up or list all the different things that the Catholic Church regarded as heresies. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of interesting in itself. And mm -hmm. like the Arius one was really quite sustained. I mean, that it went lasted over almost like 500 years. And it really affected people at the time. And it really made the ground ripe for Islam because if Jesus was not God, you know. It helped for Muhammad to say that Jesus was just a prophet, and many people in the East, you know, came to that idea, and it just it made those areas very ripe, you know, for that belief. Well, I thought it was interesting if when you line all of these up, mm -hmm. you could see how you could have a central core of teachings, mm -hmm. and just sort of the human inclination not to accept something or to find some other way to do something, and you could see the impact that this would have on. Um, the institution and the people practicing in that, and so it it almost is a separate, maybe sociological mm -hmm. dynamic that you know the people would just maybe agree or not agree or just want to bring up their own things. Some of them were a little um, 
stranger th or eccentric than others. Mm -hmm. um, but it was pretty fascinating because there was what, 15 or 17 of these that you've got listed. These heresies. And, and like you mentioned, too, there's a core of beliefs that you believe as Catholics. And it's just, there's a stability. And what I really am amazed at, if someone went to a mass like in the third century or in the 13th century or today, they'd be very similar or the sacraments or the beliefs like the prayer called the Apostles Creed that goes back to the time of the Apostles you know we're saying it 2,000 years later and even like the Latin uh, the Greek that's used in the church and uh, things like that you know the Aramaic and the Mass it's uh, really kind of it's a wonderful well, heritage and one of the lingering things or ongoing things as I was reading the book was this idea that there's always changing, and you talk about that in the book, mm -hmm. changing and developing customs and philosophies of the cultures. Um, but the other question was, how do you and your brother think that the church has managed to survive despite all of this churning that was going on? You're right, and you know that's why we named the book Tumultuous Times, because he and I look for a 25-year period of history when everything was smooth and we couldn't <laughs> find it. <laughs> so that was very tumultuous. And you know, a lot of times you think history is very smooth, but there's there's always intrigue, there's ambition, there's greed, uh, power struggles, moral corruption, laxity, and uh, you get incompetent rulers. And you know, there's all kinds of different things. And it really, as a hum human institution, if the church was that, if the Catholic Church was, it would have been faded uh, out years ago because of the attacks, like you mentioned, from heresy from without and then corruption from within. It just should have fallen apart years ago. So, um, I don't, we, uh, what I believe is there's some constants that are there. The belief in God, three persons and one God, with belief in God's law, and then that. Christ established a church and then he proved his claim by his performing miracles and rising from the dead which nobody else has <laughs> ever done and also by uh, fulfilling prophecies and it's amazing that his work stays that's what's so incredible that what the apostles heard from uh, the lips of our Lord are still heard in pulpits today you know that that belief is still there and it and uh, there's no really plausible explanation except that God had to do this because there's just no human way of any institution because we think of all the religions how they change and they you know through the course of time and beliefs are altered and things like that and uh, it's a constant that uh, is pretty amazing. Well in the book you talk about the deposit of Christ maybe you can explain what that is and how that is relevant to this point. Yeah what's called the deposit of faith is sacred scripture and tradition apostolic tradition so the early church there was no real Bibles until later around the printing press, you know, around 1483 or so when Gutenberg began printing them. Uh, before that time, a lot of the monks would spend their whole lifetime writing out a Bible. And the Bible, as we know, it really wasn't put together till about 397 Pope St. Damasus, that uh, he collected all these different writings, uh, and then they determined which were authentic and which weren't. And that's where we actually get the code of the Bible today. And uh, so in the apostolic tradition were the ceremonies that were handed down from the apostles and the different um, traditions. Tradition just means that handed down. And uh, those two things you know, are the fonts of what's called revelation that, you know, that's what Catholics believe. And uh, those are things that you just don't change because they come from Christ. Well, it seemed like a central point was to refer to those as the standard for interpreting mm -hmm. what's going on and understanding mm -hmm. what needs to happen, that that's kind of true. thing. That's very true, yeah. And it's nice because it's it's solid. It's kind of like the United States. We always go back to the Constitution, <laughs> the you know, Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, those different things. And it's kind of our foundation. Well, one <coughs> of the things that you talk about is that there were 17 illegitimate councils. And maybe talk a little bit how that genre developed or what that's, happened that's to those. That's quite, quite amazing. In the early ages, a lot of them were Arian councils. There was a priest from Libya named Arius, and he said Jesus was not God. He just was kind of like God, and there were about five or six offshoots uh, down the road from that. But a number of the emperors, actually Constantine's son, Constantius II, or sometimes he's just called Constantius, uh, had councils, and the bishops either said that Jesus was not God or else they were you know, beheaded or uh, imprisoned, and uh, there's just some different things. Uh, one, there was a bishop, uh, St. Athanasius, who was in Alexandria, Egypt. He was sent to Trier, Germany, which is about as far in the world as you could go at that time. And St. Hilary of Poitiers in France was sent to Turkey, which is 
thousands of miles away. So uh, there was a lot of political, you know, pressure and different things like that. And um, it's like there was just constant, you know, attacks to the faith by different people. And the, the church would always look, what is, what did Jesus leave us? And that's what we want to stick with. But I, th I thought it was interesting that in the process, after council made its decision, it wasn't necessarily accepted right away. It still had to be reviewed. And uh, the Pope had to, either the Pope, you know, his legate, you know, was there, and then the Pope approved it, they took it to him, right. or the Pope who was right there approved it. It was interesting, because some of the things the Popes didn't approve, there was just some, you know, minor things that just uh, had to do with, like, discipline and um, things like that, that, you know, they didn't approve, because... Uh, like one council said that, you know, the Pope has to obey us, you know, and uh, <laughs> that just didn't go because the church is kind of a monarchical, you know, structure, you know, yeah. with the papacy and things. So. What I was trying to get at is what would happen, uh, how were, was a council's rulings regarded as illegitimate? Well, I'm sorry, with the illegitimate councils, they often taught heresy and things like that. Like, um, there was a, a council called the Latrocinium or the Robber Council, and they um, killed the papal legate and things like that. And there was John the Twenty. That's not exactly a good thing to do. <laughs> you know? I don't think so. There's a um, one in Rome. Actually, there were three in Rome, so there's about twenty illegitimate councils because there were four in Rome. And um, but John the Twenty Third uh, called a council, and the uh, he was a pirate murderer an anti-pope, and uh, so that was considered illegitimate. What happened, uh, Barbarossa, Emperor Barbarossa and Frederick II tried to control the papacy, so did, um, there were a couple emperors, Henry the Fourth and Fifth. so they elected a lot of anti-popes, and that's why they had their own councils in the church that, hey, you know, this wasn't legitimate. So it's that's not going to work that way. Yeah, that's kind of how those happened. So then they would just be regarded or declared Illegitimate. Illegitimate. Because mm -hmm. if it's, you know, and a lot of them even taught erroneous things. Uh, it was funny during even one of the legitimate councils, one of the documents was forged from <laughs> a, an old <laughs> one, and they had to get someone there to check. It's like, this is for so Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> well, you talked, too, about the 41 antipopes, which I found really fascinating that, you know, there were people that sort of self-declared or just took it over, and I was... No, it really is true. You know what's interesting about that? I was going to try to give you the centuries. Okay, here it is. Um, Anti-popes are illegitimate popes. There's a time, like some emperors try to make their own popes, and that's one type of anti-pope. And others were just um, people that, you know, claimed to be pope. You know, some people didn't like the pope and claimed themselves pope. Right now, I think there's 11 or 12 people claiming to be pope in the in the world right now. It's is that right? Crazy. Yeah, yeah, it's just really pretty weird. But there were anti-popes in the 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, 14th, and 15th centuries. So the only century they didn't have it was the 1st, 2nd, 13th, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th. So if history repeats itself, we haven't had an anti-pope for 557 years, and it's about time. It's interesting, since Vatican II, the last five popes are teaching something completely different than the 260 that go before them, and some people claim them to be anti-pope. It's kind of an amazing thing, because most Catholics and non-Catholics never heard of anti-popes. I was shocked that there were 41 of them, and if you, if you put those numbers together, I mean, that's, that's quite a few. Yeah, and that they would occur with that kind of regularity or frequency and across the whole span. It, it, it's a logic, but I didn't realize either until you no. had that list in the book that there were 41. I thought, no. wow, that really is... No, it, what's interesting too, Jim, is a time when there were three popes at once. One of them was pirate murderer, and uh, <laughs> John the Twenty Third. And there was a period, it's called the Western Schism, <coughs> from 1378 to 1418. And there were two or three people claiming to be pope at once. And uh, it had to do with politics. One of this, these popes who started, where it started, is he was just very, didn't have any tact. I don't know how else to explain it, and was a cruel person. And so the cardinals didn't like him, so they just elected someone who was uh, a relative to the king of France, and they wanted to go back to France. So it was a free ride for him. And, uh, so Actually, there's quite an interplay with the politics in the church over the mm -hmm. church's history. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, there was, I, perhaps it's because the emperors and other leaders like that just envied, you know, the 
power issue, but that's true. And you know, talks about <coughs> Henry the Second who killed Thomas a Becket, and then the um, there was a number of different things. Um, Hildebrand, I think it's Henry the Fourth, and different things like that. There were a lot of uh, different events, and the what happened too. This is what several of the Lateran councils tried to prevent: is the kings and nobles were electing the bishops, and basically they'd want to know: Can you hunt? Can you fish? Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know how to ride All a horse. All those important tasks. Yeah, you got to do what I tell you. Then okay, you can be a bishop. And it wasn't always that bad. There were some good bishops made, but you know, a lot of them, um, that, that was all controlled politically, and it, it really caused a major problem, and the church just said, it, you know, that's not going to be permitted anymore. <coughs> but I thought that idea of taking the whole 20, you know, that whole history of 20 councils mm -hmm. was quite an interesting framework for then coming to the second part of your book in Vatican II and what you call, you and your brother call the radical changes of Vatican II, which you argue has uh, hurled many unsuspecting Catholics into a new church that has the semblance of Catholicism, but lacks many of its essential elements. And mm -hmm. So maybe you can explain that. Yeah, I like that. Maybe I could just give you an analogy, because I was trying to think how to explain it. <coughs> Say you just bought a new Ford, and then you go lift up the hood and you see a Chevy engine, <laughs> and that's not supposed to be there. Then you go and look at the steering wheel, and it has a Chrysler logo, so does the glove box. Go outside, you see Toyota wheel covers, and then in the trunk, there's a Nissan emblem. And then you take the owner's manual out, and you found out you have a BMW transmission. It's just not the same. And what happened at Vatican II, just in a nutshell, is there have been 20 councils, legitimate councils, before Vatican II, and Vatican II kind of just tried to undo all them and ignore history. The major elements of the Catholic faith are the Mass, the sacraments, and the teachings of Christ, and all three of those were radically changed. And I use the word radically because it wasn't just like putting in fuel injection or uh, air conditioning, things like that, because that's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you want to upgrade. Nobody wants to ride a Model T today. And uh, But to change things essentially and things that were condemned in the past became the teachings of today and uh, so out of seven sacraments you know these they just change so much I mean all the words are changed the oils are changed and like I said if our Lord made a lot of mistakes and you know he needed help that'd be different but um, and then we see a lot of change in belief um, the idea about universal salvation all the funerals now are done with white vestments to show that everybody goes to heaven and that would be nice, but, you know, it's good to pray for people, too. That's why the customary black. Uh, ecumenism is saying that all the religions have the truth. All the gods are basically the same. Indifferentism, one religion is good as another. And so it is a really a different church. Well, and in the book you say that, uh, or imply, that those who are teaching these modern heresies are not shepherds, but wolves disguised in sheep's clothing. That's mm -hmm. even more pointed. <laughs> it is, but you know, if what's kind of interesting is the person in charge is responsible. It's kind of like a business. Uh, we see, you know, different uh, companies having problems, but you always go back to the CEO, and our Lord said by their fruits you will know them. And what I'm amazed at is the statistics since Vatican II, the tremendous loss of faith. In the U.S., there's about 600,000 Hispanics that leave the church every year. Mass attendance since 1960 has dropped about 50%. Um, wow. And that's from a Gallup poll. You know? I mean, it's, it used to be 75%, now it's right around 25%. And, and all over the world, you know, in Australia, Argentina, Ireland, it dropped about 20%. Um, Belgium, this is pretty incredible, um, Belgium and Holland used to be somewhat Catholic countries. 3% of people go to church there. England and France, about 7%. I mean, the Catholic faith is almost dead in uh, Europe. Um, Italy has the lowest birth rate in the world, which is pretty shocking to some people. Ireland has half as many priests as it did before. In 1962, there were over 56, oh, sorry, 46,000 seminarians in the U.S. Now there's about 4,300. Um, 4,300. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a dying church. And um, like Walmart, if you opened up like 15, 16 stores, if you closed 16 stores and opened up one, you'd be thinking you're going downhill. And the parish I grew up in Toledo is closed, and along with like 15 or 16 others, and they opened up a new parish. And 
I mean, you don't, you can't keep those uh, statistics going indefinitely. The number of priests has gone down dramatically. In the 60s, there are about 56,000. We've got about 40 some thousand now, about 44,000. But there's only 30,000 active priests. But within five to 10 years, there's going to be about 15,000 priests in the U.S. for uh, 19,000 parishes. So 15,000 diocesan clergy. And uh, the or religious orders don't have that much. There's about one out of five parishes don't have a priest already. And it's going to go down to, you know, very nil after that. So uh, sisters, what's incredible, the teaching nuns, a lot of people are familiar with that when they were younger. There were about 180,000 in 1964. Today they're 74,000, but their average age is 69. And out of the Sisters of Mercy, there's 6,000 Sisters of Mercy. There's only 240 under the age of 45. So there's just no future. Teaching nuns are used to be about 100,000 uh, teaching nuns in 65. Today there's about 7,000. So it's just um, marriage is about half of what they were. You know, Catholics have the same amount of abortions as the general populace. Uh, same with divorce is one out of two Catholic marriages ends up in divorce. I kind of want to go back to sure. the, the question is will the church some survive these tumultuous times? Because now you've added the issues, you know, there's allegations of sexual abuse mm -hmm. and there's birth control issues and abortion and all that. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's going to survive? It will. Our Lord, you know, it's kind of interesting. He addressed that same question and he said when the Son of Man will return, will he find faith on the earth? So it's not going to be huge numbers. And, you know, the Catholic faith is not a real popular religion because it has a lot of rules. <laughs> Nobody likes rules. <laughs> and uh, and it's, it's a little bit difficult to follow, you know, in a sense. But there is uh, a continuity. And there's what's kind of amazing is there's Catholics all over the world that are still preserving their faith. You know, like Vatican II made everything so nebulous that they don't even know what they stand for. You know, it's called, we call it the post-conciliar church because it's, it's a different church from what, what Christ established. And um, so, but the church will last till the end of time. Our Lord promised, I said, I'll be with you all days into the consummation of the world. And what I do see is a lot of young people getting back into it. Well, I thought it was an interesting book for a, a reason that I, or a, yeah, that I didn't anticipate, which was underneath it, there was this line of continuity. That mm -hmm. there were tumultuous times, but it was throughout. And like you said mm -hmm. earlier, um, there wasn't one 25-year period where there wasn't. You know, it really, it looked like a lot of times that the church would just phase away, you know, it just disappear, and it, it just never did. And uh, But I, I really am amazed that we can go back to history and see what happened earlier, because like you're saying, Jim, you get some hope by looking back. That's the part that you always get out of it, that, you know, everything... Um, God always wins, and it, it just uh, just to try to stay faithful, and things always work out. You know. Well, thank you for being on Rip Rap. Oh, thank you very much. God bless you. <laughs> <laughs>